Hello, I'm James Gurney and welcome to History Infection Part 5, Malaria. Malaria is another truly ancient disease. Most human pathogens have been with us since the dawn of time, but what makes diseases like malaria different is the way they're transmitted. Unlike cholera or typhoid, which require large urban populations to really get a, a stranglehold on a population, malaria can be spread by a vector. And this vector is a mosquito. Malaria isn't actually the mosquito, it's a parasite that lives inside and infects the Anopheles mosquito. This is the reason why it's an ancient disease. Not because it's older than other diseases, but because it's had an effect on human history for much longer than many other diseases that require urban populations. Something very interesting, malaria used to be far more widespread than we currently think of it today. Malaria was actually found up until the 1950s in the UK. Our earliest recordings of malaria come from 2700 BCE from a Chinese medical text. In the 4th century BCE, Hippocrates described three different kinds of malaria based on the symptoms. The symptoms he noted were the fevers, either daily, every other day, or every three days these fevers would present themselves. The diseases were more or less the same in every other aspect apart from these fevers. So back to malaria. Here's a distinction for you. Malaria is not actually a pathogen. It's not actually uh, an organism. Well, it can be, but never mind. It's a disease that's caused by a group of pathogens that are a set of uh, parasites known as plasmodium. This is the same way that meningitis isn't actually a pathogen. It's, it's the description of the disease you get from getting certain pathogens. Malaria means bad air, male air which of course was coined before the rejection of miasmic theory, which was the topic of our previous video, The Curious Case of Dr. Pettenkoffer. Malaria is thought to be caused by the foul and stagnant swamps and marshes in some areas, particularly the vapours of these swamps and marshes. The link between malaria and mosquito was made by Ron Ross in 1897. He was following up in work on his mentor, Patrick Mason, who had discovered a link between a mosquito carrying a parasite that caused uh, elephantitis, the swelling of a local area. On the 20th of August, 1897, sometimes known as Malaria Day, Ross had this to say, This day relenting God hath placed within my hand a wondrous thing, and God be praised at his command, seeking his secret deeds. With tears and towing breath, I find thy cunning seeds. O million murdering death, I know this little thing a myriad man will save. O death, where is thy sting? Thy victory, O grave. Quite poetic for a scientist. Ross was in India working on dissecting the stomachs of mosquitoes. It was here that he found evidence of pigmented cysts in the stomachs of these mosquitoes, which looked like the cysts found in patients suffering with malaria. From this, Ross was able to work out the life cycle of the avian malaria parasite and go on to pioneer using nets to pre prevent mosquito bites while sleeping. An Italian group led by Giovanni Garassiai showed that in 1898, the human form of malaria is carried by the Anopheles mosquito and went on to show the life cycle of this mosquito. However, in 1902, when the Nobel Prize was awarded to Ross for his work on malaria, the Italian group were overlooked for some reason and no one's really too sure why. Their work had shown the human vector of the disease and worked out its life cycle. Surely they deserve quite a bit of credit as well. That aside, what is malaria? Malaria is a disease caused by a parasite. The parasite tends to cause fever and chills and nausea and other horrible, quite horrible symptoms which you can look up if you so wish. It's a great example of how a parasite, or a pathogen even, can be manifest itself in the symptoms due to its life cycle. Depending on the cycle of days between fever and chills, you can work out and rule out some of the different plasmodiums that could be causing a person's malaria. This difference is due to the different life cycles of the different parasites. Here's a diagram of Falciparium plasmodium's life cycle. The infection can be split into two stages. The first, which is the asymptomatic, involves the asexual reproduction of sporozoites in the infected person's liver. This stage normally lasts around 15 days. From here, the infection moves on to infect the red blood cells. And when this happens, an immune response has occurred and a fever happens when the, the, the sporozoites come out of the liver, and this is when the host begins to show symptoms. The infected liver cells are killed, and now the pathogen enters the red blood cells. When these are ready to leave, they lyse the red blood cells, leading to the chills of the person losing red blood cells. The life cycle of, of falciparum means it can produce an almost constant fever and chills, whereas vivaxia has fevers every 48 hours, which is due to the parasite's life cycle of infecting and emerging in succession. Less common causes of malaria, such as Plasmonium malariae, even though it shares the name malaria with the condition, has a three-day fever cycle. 
Quinine was discovered to be a reasonably good cure for malaria in around 1820. This is when it was being extracted from the bark of the uh, cinconia tree, or cinchona tree. This meant that for the first time, there was an effective way of treating malaria, which, as a discovery, helped open up Africa to some rather heavy exploitation. I owe my existence to the exploitation of Africa as my family, until very recently, had been based in India and Southern Africa. So to sidestep that whole issue, um, let's talk about malaria treatment, treating other diseases. It'd been noted for quite a while that people who were suffering from syphilis could become cured if they developed a very high fever. Malaria causes a very high fever. And now there's a cure to get rid of the malaria. So a doctor by the name of Julius Wagner Jurg, whose name I'm sure I've just completely mispronounced, decided to test to see if he could cure his patients of syphilis using malaria. He infected his patients with malaria and they developed a very high fever and when they tested later they were in fact cured of syphilis. He then went on to treat the malaria with quinone and they recovered from the malaria. So from this he managed to treat a person for the first time successfully of syphilis. This wasn't some sort of quack treatment thought out by a mad doctor roguely doing his maverick thing. He won the 1927 Nobel Prize for this treatment. But this story has another interesting twist. The malaria that was used from in the hospitals was just taken from patient to patient. It was never a wild captured malaria parasite. It was just continually re-inoculated from infected people. This meant that the parasite didn't have to care about how infectious it became. All of a sudden, it didn't matter how much damage it did to its host, it could evolve to become more pathogenic. In normal circumstances, if a parasite becomes too virulent, the host can't help in spreading the disease. If you have a cold, chances are you'll go out to work or to the shops and you can spread it. But if you have the worst cold of your life, you'll just stay in bed. You won't be able to move. So the, you spreading the disease will, will stop. This is what happened with the malaria in the hospitals. Because it didn't have to care about how dangerous it made itself, it just became more and more virulent until the point where it became resistant to quinoline and more likely to kill the person than syphilis. So what of malaria today? Well, it still kills nearly, maybe over, a million people worldwide, and that's just falciparium plasmodia. It's a terrible condition, and nearly something like 200 million people worldwide are infected with some form of malaria parasite. Bill and Melinda Gates' charity is trying to eradicate malaria, which I think is a very noble goal, but in my humble opinion, flawed. I don't think it's possible to eradicate malaria to the extent of, say, smallpox. This is for many different complicated reasons, but I think it's nothing wrong with trying. Um, I think our money would be better spent trying to manipulate malaria into becoming less virulent, i.e. I using more nets and reducing the vector distribution, things like that, but that's beside the point. If we could reduce the virulence, then the world would be a better place. One final issue, global climate change will of course have a dramatic um, effect on the location and virulence of malaria in the future. Something that might sound like an issue to begin with is when first world countries start experiencing what malaria is like again, um, this would hopefully actually open up more research into malaria. Even though people will become infected, it would hopefully see make the first world country see exactly what the rest of the world is having to suffer with with malaria and other vector-borne diseases. So that's a brief history of malaria. I want to talk next time about the plague, but that'll have to wait. Instead, I'm going to talk about my own first-hand experience of a recent hospital trip I was lucky enough, I guess, to uh, have happened to me. So next time I'll be talking about Campylobacter and Helicobacter, both which are interesting, and Helicobacter has a very cool story about how it led someone winning the Nobel Prize, another great self-experimentation. Um, I hope you'll join me then. Uh, feel free to subscribe and like and share if you enjoyed that and all that stuff. I'm sure you will, um, if you liked it. I um, hope you'll join me next time. Thanks for watching.